Anyone can start aging wine. That means you too, anyone. You just need a dark, quiet place, no vibration, tuck the wine in there, twiddle your thumbs for the next 30 years, and magic happens. Hey, I'm sommelier Andre Mack, and today we're gonna taste the exact same wine at five different ages, from 2016 to 1978. A lot can happen to wine, and especially over five different decades, and today we're gonna take a deep dive inside. Most wine in America, I think 90% of wine is consumed within 24 hours after purchase. But if you have a chance to taste any wine that's aged for quite some time, you know, I like to compare it to a caterpillar transforming into a, a butterfly. It would definitely change your perception of wine. So today I'm really excited to introduce you guys to Height Cellar, considered one of the top Napa Valley wineries. It's all the exact same varietal, which is actually in the industry known as a vertical tasting. Right, so it's the exact same wine, tasting over many different vintages. 40 something years? This is a pretty baller tasting with a legend within Napa Valley, Joe Heights. So the first thing we're gonna look at today is gonna be the bottles and the labels. I think the biggest thing that you're gonna look at here is vintage. Vintage means that at least 97% of those grapes have to be harvested during that particular year. So that doesn't indicate when the wine actually went into bottle. They were harvested somewhere around the later part of that year, and then they have to go through fermentation and the whole winemaking process. Uh, and then generally they're aged in oak cast for quite some time, anywhere from 18 to 24 months. I always like to think of oak barrels more as seasoning, right? It's like salt and pepper. And at the end of that, it's finally bottled. So just like wines have ratings, you know, some people go through, vintages have ratings. And when we talk about a good year or a good vintage, we're talking about great growing conditions, the weather is right. Wine is this living, breathing thing uh, that really depends on mother nature, right? To get the best crop and you get one shot at it each year. Uh, and that's kind of what makes it special. I think with anything collectible, the price tends to shoot up. Old vintage American wine is pretty hot market right now. So we, a lot of those prices are starting to skyrocket. I like to think that you're paying for the time. The time that it's been aged, it's not a lot of it around anymore. You're paying for the magic, you know, the integration, the experience of drinking something old. You can see the evolution of the labels. You know, for a couple years, they almost look exactly the same. And then, you know, on the 2016, it looks like there was a label change. It looks a little bit more modern. You know, we're all into storytelling. There's a little verbiage telling the story about the winery. Uh, the government label is on every single wine, as that is law. But if you look at something like 1978, there is no back label. And as you look at all the capsules, you can see how they've all changed. And something here in the 90s, they actually put a wax covering on it. This is somewhat porous, but this is like so the corks don't push up over time through the foil and expose the wine to oxygen, but this was definitely a 90s thing. All of these are artifacts from there. It's, it's really interesting, especially when you think about wines from Europe in this particular era, like these two. They would always tell you to cut underneath the second lip or pull it directly off because these actually contain lead. And so you didn't want any lead on your wine when you were pouring from the bottle. I think another great visible thing that you can see is the eulage, and that's just a fancy word for the fill level. As wine is aged, you know, it evaporates a tiny bit. You want to take a look at the eulage. If anything, is that shoulder level. These are considered the shoulders of the bottle. Then you know the wine has gone through some type of trauma during the aging process, whether, you know, overheating and there's been some seepage or stuff like that. So we're going to open these up and look at the tops of these corks. So we're going to pop open the 2016 right now. So we look here, it's cork, very clean, looks brand new. So this is a current release, that's something that I would expect. You know, it's porous, right? It's a closure, but it's slightly porous that allows small bits of oxygen to kind of seep through and break down the wine over time, enhancing the aging process. So very clean cork, looks fairly new, light color wine. So this is 2007, this looks fairly new. You know, I just always rip these off. You can see how the cork is red, is saturated with wine here. So you can tell that the wine has been stored properly on its side. And also, you know, you want the wine to be in contact with the cork uh, just to keep the cork moist. When a cork starts to dry out, it allows more oxygen in and wine starts to seep out. So you can look at all these labels. The first thing you can tell that they're pretty clean. When the wine seeps, you can see it going down the side of the bottle or onto the label. That's a telltale sign that something happened in the cellar. So we have 2016 here. Over here we have the 2007. So 2007, a little bit darker, you can see that for sure. This is a little difficult with a wax top. And generally what I tell people, try not to cut it by cutting it. You know, I've seen people cut their thumbs and things like that. Uh, it's probably easier just to go directly in and then it'll pop right off. Hit it once and then you'll hit it again. And look at that, just like a true professional. I broke the cork 
it happens, so don't worry. Wine has been in it since 1994, so it's, you know, it's starting to seep up. It's a little softer, it's a little bit pliable, so you have to take your time doing it. This is interesting, this is a Duran. So this is you know, a combination. This is called an Asso, and this is uh, kind of one of the first corkscrews. They call it a, a butler's corkscrew. Uh, and you have these two thin blades on the side here that you kind of like pinch inside, and they wedge, you wedge them between the cork and the bottle. And this is what we're all familiar with. This is called um, the Helix. And so this keeps the cork in one piece. You know, I just want to tell everybody, it's like, we're not wine snobs, we're just nerds. Right? You, know, you know what I mean? Like all this information is not to be arrogant and to be an ass about it. It's something that, you know, we're passionate about and which ultimately makes us nerds. We're gonna slide this in this, uh, either side of the cork. We've inserted the Helix. We're all the way in. And then now we just slowly turn and pull. There you go. So we moved in 1985. When you start to get in some of the older wines, you definitely want to compare the vintage on the cork to the vintage on the front label. As you start to collect wine, there's a lot of money that goes into it, which means that there's possibly counterfeit. All right, and now it's 1978. So now if you look at this, this is impeccable for 1978. Looks almost brand new. It's amazing. I'm older than this wine, if you're asking that. <laughs> the scariest part of all of it is when, you, when you're extracting the cork, sometimes I've seen you know, the glass break, and at that point you can't serve the wine. Give it a little muscle. So you can see the bottom here has wine on it, it's, looks like full contact. See how it's kind of seeped up here a little bit? And then you can see the vintage here, 1978. After opening all these bottles, I'm pretty excited. Now we're gonna move on and take a look at their appearance. So we have the 2016 here. You can see it's like bright kind of exuberant, just has a shine and a sheen to it. So just looking at it, I'm like, oh, this looks like, you know, new wine, fresh wine, young wine. You know, this looks like a neon raspberry to me. That, and, and actually that's not a wine term, I know. Normally to examine a wine's color and to have it tell you more secrets, you want to turn it on its side slightly. And what you want to look at is the outer rim, which is, uh, which is known as the meniscus. If it has a watery rim, it means that the wine is pretty young. Red wine gets its color from the skins. And so during the winemaking process, we soak the juice on the skins and that extracts color. It also extracts a few other things. It's gonna extract, you know, tannin. Tannins are astringent. It's more of a, a feeling that you get than a flavor. Uh, and tannin kind of sucks the moisture out of your mouth, leaving your mouth kind of dry. So there's many different phenols in wine, tannin being one of them. And these different compounds and molecules attach to each other and start to fall out of a wine, which produce sediment. So the pigment and the color of wine, as it starts to age over time, they start to combine with other compounds and start to fall out of the wine. So as a wine starts to age, the color fades. And we can see that over the, the range of the bottles that we'll open today. So now we're pouring the 2007. Kind of lost that lip gloss, kind of raspberry thing that was happening before. Uh, as you start to look at it, there is a little bit of water rim on the meniscus, showing that it is youthful, but not as much as the previous wine. We have the 1994, and automatically you can just see the difference. A little bit more brickish. There is a little bit of watery rim, just slightly uh, less than the previous wine. Yeah, you can definitely tell that it's older. So with this particular wine, we're starting to get into some of the older wines. This is the 1985. I would recommend decanning, just to kind of remove the sediment from the wine, right? Because that, that's a very unpleasant drinking experience. This is called a cellar rat, and it comes with a candle, but we just modified it by using a flashlight. So we're gonna pour the wine and decant it, slowly into the decanter. We wanna light up the neck so we can know when to stop pouring as we start to see some of the sediment come through. And I'm constantly monitoring the neck just, just to make sure that there's not a flow of sediment seeping into the wine. As you can tell, it's not an exact science. All right, so we have sediment trapped in the neck. So we decanted the wine here, and we can actually see what's left here. So actually, when I turn the glass up here, you can see it clinging to the side of the glass. It's almost like a soot. It tastes almost sandy, granular. And so you kind of want to remove that. Definitely an old wine, just looking at it, starting to be really brick. You know, a brick that was a little bit faded, no watery meniscus, so this is telling that the wine has some sign of age to it. 2016 here, uh, 1978 here, you can see a big difference in the color. So red with more like a purple hue here, kind of shiny and glossy. Here for 78, it's brickish orange. It doesn't jump at you, it's not as bright. I'm totally excited, like this is, this is what I live for. This is, 
a great tasting. <laughs> it actually is. It is. This is like cool. This is like like high on the food chain, like good here. This is, this is a really fun experiment. All right, so next up, we're gonna taste the wine. So we're gonna be looking for a couple of different things, fruit, acid, alcohol, tannin, uh, and the overall taste of the wines. We're gonna start with the 2016. I'm just gonna hop in and, and start to taste. So there's definitely like a fruit component, not over the top, which sometimes you would really associate with uh, Napa Valley Cabernet. It's got pretty good acid. You know, my sides of my tongue are starting to tingle. Uh, that's an indicator of a wine having good acid. Alcohol seems pretty moderate. It's not hot. That's just industry talk for it being overly alcoholic. One of the reasons why you would lay down a wine or age a wine is so that, you know, all these three components become more symbiotic with each other, producing a much more balanced wine drinking experience. Primary fruit is generally fruit that is expressive of that grape exactly. And in young wines, you tend to get you know, that jammy, overly fruity, ripe fruit, that's the grape talking to you in a young wine. If the wine was too overly fruity or jammy, I think it could benefit from some aging. Um, this wine has pretty decent acidity, which leads me to believe that this should age pretty well. So we have 2007, I'm just gonna dive right in. Already, it just feels like a more, more depth of fruit, right? It just goes down layers and layers. It smells a lot richer. It's kind of like night and day already uh, from 2016 to 2007. I mean, that's amazing. No tannins at all. So, you know, there's no astringent drying out of the mouth. There is some acidity. It still has fruit to it. Um, lots of fruit, really ripe. Uh, but not overly ripe. This is a totally different wine compared to the 2016. You know, the maturity of fruit, it's, it's almost like, you know, you took ripe fruit off the vine for 16, this fruit, you put it in the pot and you added a little bit of heat to it. And now you, you're starting to, the flavors are commingling and you, you can smell a little bit of it. And so it has layers to it. As wine changes over time, the structure of the wine changes. It tastes more velvety. A lot of times when we talk about structure, we talk about whole milk versus 2% milk and how it coats your palate. And so you're going from whole milk, which is kind of fatty and rich and kind of thick on the mouth to skim milk, where it's just a little bit more refined. Now we're moving on to 1994. One of the greatest vintages of my time uh, being in wine. Um, also probably one of the greatest vintages ever in Napa. So I'm super excited to taste this wine. Oh no. Oh no. It's corked. Um, so um, this wine is undrinkable. Uh, I don't think that you would get sick if you drank it, um, but it's not what the wine intended to be. Uh, and so this is affected, uh, it affects quite a few bottles. And this is a tank from a faulty cork uh, that makes it smell like a wet cardboard or a wet animal, like a wet dog. Cork is a living, breathing thing as well. So it can be aff affected by a, a, a taint or a virus that's in it and it affects the wine. And generally speaking, one out of one bottle out of every case is corked. It's a shame, but it happens. It goes with the territory. You know what I mean? Like, um, you know, the hard part is if you paid for it and now you have to figure out, you know, a lot of times there's no recourse to get your money back. This is crazy. So now we have 1985. This should be fun. Yeah, so like dark pink cherries, leather, tobacco, tiny bit of cedar. And a thing that I always get like in old wines is like a dash of soy sauce, which is always kind of weird. It's not the salty part that you get, it's kind of more the, the fermentation part of it that you get. This is like an old leathers, catcher's mitt. You know, it's like walking into a vintage store, not overly tannic, pretty, pretty round, uh, great acid. There's still some fruit left to it. 2007, that's when you started to get that primary fruit uh, that was like kind of ripe, rich, uh, that kind of thing. And now you're starting to get what we like to call the treasury flavors to it. So when I talk about soy sauce and leather, and it's making for a more balanced wine in my opinion. But you know, you like what you like. And so if you like more youthful jammy wines, then I guess you should drink those. To me, this is kind of, this 85 is kind of right at its peak, but I'm not sure what happens in 78. I'm intrigued and I'm super stoked that we do have 78 so we can compare. All right, so 78, here we go. Wow, so, <clears throat> and this is the funny thing about wine, whereas you thought 85, that particular showing at 85 might have peaked, at least a little bit in my opinion, like I didn't think it could get any better. The 78, is phenomenal. It still has like this core rich thing of fruit. 
it has leather, it has, um, wow, it's got acid steel, it's a little bit more light body, it's not like a long finish. It's got spice to it, there's a, a tad bit of anise to it. Just a total different experience, like if you look at this versus 2016 or 7, um, you would almost think that this was a different grape varietal. From a nerd's perspective, you get excited about that because this is, uh, you're drinking history in a way. This wine I think is exceptional. Wine's just an incredible thing, right? It, it's, uh, it changes and evolves over time. And is this accessible to people? I think that's like the biggest thing. Like, I know that like, this isn't possible for a lot of people at this level. So if you ever get a chance to do something like that, I would recommend it. It's just a great kind of way to kind of geek out over wine. You know, a lot of times there's no recourse to get your money back because, you know, it's a final sale kind of thing. So you have to eat it. Bon Appetit's getting the bill. I think so. <laughs> I think so. This is crazy. I encourage you all to spell this. <laughs>